On Monday, the 23rd of March, 2020, the UK suddenly went quiet. Planes stopped droning, streets emptied, traffic died away and schools silenced. A hush descended onto the country and the natural world breathed a sigh of relief and bloomed and blossomed. It was the start of a free month countrywide lockdown to attempt to resist the coronavirus. But then, on the following Thursday evening, came a tumult of noise. Cheers, clatterings, clappings, pan bashings, bagpipes, bells and the bashing of drums all resounded around us. This was the Thursday night clap for carers a weekly hullabaloo that quickly caught on all over the country, a noisy eruption that lasted 10 weeks. I remember seeing on social media that people were going to start clapping from their doorsteps, but I hadn't really stopped to think about it. Then at about quarter to eight on the first night, I heard a clatter of feedback and a guitar tuning up. Within half an hour, a band had formed. Over the lockdown, we heard a wonderful variety of noise-making, from simple clapping and cheering, the applause to um, banging the pots and pans, bagpipes sounded, car horns sounded, sirens went off, fireworks were less off initially, Um, people played musical instruments, electric guitars, saxophones, hunting horns rang out. The variety of sound was wonderful and varied. It was surprising how many different instruments turned up as it went on and always accompanied by pots and pans left over from the clapping. It was nice, it was like we were all in it together. Norma from Worcestershire used to be a nurse. She said that the clap did her a lot of good and that a huge bell could be heard ringing out from a tower along her road to mark the Thursday evenings. She said we'd get this clunking bell, some of us were clapping, some were knocking saucepans, and it's just a little hamlet. I live in a very rural area, a mile away from the nearest village. I'd heard about the Thursday clap, but hadn't thought of joining in, because the TV images that I'd seen of it showed people in city streets and flats clapping in their doorways. On the second Thursday, I heard someone making a steady and insistent noise on something that sounded like a frying pan. It aroused my interest immediately. Because everything around us was so quiet back then, the usual background noises had gone. So the following Thursday, I thought I'd join in. Prepared with a sieve and wooden spoon, I stood in the garden at eight o'clock, feeling pleasantly full of anticipation. This Thursday night clap was initiated by Amanda Plass, herself inspired by something similar in her home country of Holland. The idea of a public display of thanks and appreciation to health workers. I clap for my colleagues, working on the front line in the NHS while I'm allowed to work from home. The idea quickly caught on, spread mainly by social media, On April the 2nd, The Guardian reported that for a second week in a row, people up and down the country stood at their front doors, outside their windows, on balconies, in high rises to clap, to cheer and bang pots and pans for those working on the front line of the fight against the coronavirus. On that 2nd of April, this clap was extended to all the key workers helping keep the country running. Anne-Marie Platt posted, Tonight we will show our appreciation again for all that go out to work so we can stay in. I clap for my husband and the teachers who are trying to help educate key worker kids and teaching the others from home. 
I clap for the wonderful frontline workers who are generous, dedicated and risking their lives for all of us. This initial aspect of the clap, the need to show support, respect and admiration for the people keeping the country going and risking their lives to help people, was what gave the event such momentum. Well, the Thursday evening clapping. I really enjoyed it. It was a lovely chance to see all the neighbours in the same place at the same time, which rarely happens usually. And we used to stop for a socially distanced chat afterwards too. I didn't really know my neighbours before the pandemic. I live in a building of single occupancy flats, so you catch people on the way to work, but that was it really. As soon as we were on lockdown, we got to know each other pretty quickly. We'd sit on the step in our identical plastic chairs and enjoy the music, socially distanced with a few drinks. <laughs> in a time of enforced social isolation, this Thursday clap became a focus of community and connection. There was one lady at the end of the street who was usually very gregarious and sociable. Uh, she'd been told very firmly by her son she was not to go out and she'd actually become quite anxious about the whole situation. And the first week she was upstairs waving and clapping from a bedroom window. But after a couple of weeks uh, she actually came downstairs and then she joined us outside so it was really lovely to see her getting her confidence back a bit and joining in all the clapping and obviously the chatting afterwards as well. I've had a bit of a rough time personally with Covid. My grandma passed away early on in the initial lockdown and I couldn't attend her funeral and then a couple of weeks ago I was made redundant because my workplace still can't open due to the restrictions. Talking to people about it has really helped though, and it's made me realise how many other people are going through the same thing. As well as giving a much needed boost to our key workers, the campaign has also had a dramatic impact on the spirits of the whole nation, with many people on social citing how they've never felt more connected to their community, despite the fact that we're all locked inside. Creative Review, April the 9th. Frank Chalmers of the Lisenden Gardens Tenants Association told the BBC that the weekly ritual has been very good for the community and promised to go out of a bang this evening. There are people in the state who have said they feel really isolated and they look forward to Thursday evenings. It is the highlight of the week. They feel part of something bigger. Mr Chalmers says as a result of the weekly clap, there are now plans to hold regular concerts with local children performing and to celebrate the local community, as well as sharing a weekly newsletter. We probably never would have stopped to talk otherwise, and I don't think I'd have gotten through it without all their support. It never hurts to check in on someone, even if you don't know them. And I think, amongst all the awful news, the pandemic has really taught us to be kinder and more understanding of each other. Research for the Together campaign found the public felt more connected to their neighbours than before the crisis. A poll found that 60% agreed that the public response to coronavirus has shown the unity of our society more than its divides. As The Guardian noted, this clap for carers was a new national ritual. A ritual of celebration, one of those communal acts that help us at the key times of our lives. These rituals take us out of ourselves to join in something larger. We lose ourselves in the bigger picture. As Anne-Marie Plass commented, we were so focused on our individual lives, but now we're getting more connected with each other, uniting, coming together and acknowledging we need each other more than ever. Noise is a key part of the ritual, an important part of how we celebrate and mark special occasions a part of the vocabulary of ritual and celebration. 
a vocabulary that includes wedding cans, wassail shotguns, New Year's bells and horns, birthday hooters, funeral fusillades, pots and pan processes, and football rattles. Sounds help us mark the season, special times and special places. Tell people we're here and help us protest. Noise is at the heart not only of how we celebrate, but also how we've disputed and argued over who we are and how we should behave or misbehave. I found that I really enjoyed the freedom of simply making a noise, sometimes just simple beats, sometimes rhythms. I could hear other noise making going on, some wafting in from the village, some closer. I could make out horns and brass instruments, as well as household percussion. I suppose that clapping doesn't carry too well in the countryside, so people make louder noises so as to be heard. It was quite exciting when sometimes a call and response happened between nearby houses. Noise is a scary fire. It frightens off bad energy and is a key part of the ritual of exorcism, what Mercia Elad called the anti-demonic magic of noise. In Somerset, we bang pots and pans, fire shotguns and let off firecrackers to keep disease off the cider crop, to keep away evil spirits. Chinese firecrackers expel evil spirits and their red batters bring luck. This function of noise as the driver away of bad energy and the bringer of luck is a key part of how we use sound in these rituals. The banging of pots and pans is part of the community rituals known as rough musics, or skimmingtons. The word skimmington comes from the skimming ladle used in cheese making in Somerset. Rioters dressed as Lady Skimmington during uprisings, like the ones in Dorset, Wiltshire and Gloucestershire in the 1620s and 30s. Skimmington also became the general term for rough music in England. Thomas Hardy describes instruments of the rough music in the, the Mayor of Casterbridge. With the din of cleavers, tongs, tambourines, pit crowds, humstrung serpents, cram horns, and other historical crimes. Rough musics have been recorded against infidelity, wife and child beating, enclosures, strikes and uppity vigor. Recently, pots and pans appeared in the anti-capitalist protests of the late 1990s and early 2000s, also known as the casserole protests. But these skimmingtons are not confined to protest and riot, as we can see in the example of wedding and birthday noise. All this lovely clamour recalls times when we were a less inhibited nation. In 1607, the German visitor Paul Mentzber commented, The British excel in dancing and music, for they are active and lively. They are vastly fond of great noises that fill the air, such as the firing of cannons, drums and the ringing of bells, so that it is common for a number of them, when drunk, to go up into some belfry and ring the bells for hours together. The lockdown also developed its own soundtrack. Tunes like Somewhere Over the Rainbow and We'll Meet Again became popular. Tunes like Don't Get Around Much Anymore, Lean On Me, Bring Me Sunshine, Moon River.
But the clap also became embroiled in controversy and debate. Although not initiated by officialdom, it was, perhaps inevitably, taken up by members of the government and the Queen. The photo opportunities were too big to miss. But then on May the 2nd, an anonymous doctor wrote in The Guardian, I'm an NH doctor. I've had enough of people clapping for me. I think that it was lovely to show support for the key workers who were putting themselves at risk and making huge sacrifices. But I think in practical terms, perhaps they could have benefited from better pandemic management skills from the government more so than a clap. But um, I don't know what the correct answer is here. Um, Although the clap itself was a nice way to get together with the neighbours and check in with the community. Many pointed to the hypocrisy of applauding workers after holding VE Day parties that broke social distancing guidelines. How we celebrate and commemorate is always in part a political act, reflecting both our values and the sense of where we come from and where we belong. Mixed feelings for me, too. I agree with Molly. It soon became something else, an easy gesture that did more to make us feel better than actually help the NHS. Maybe it galvanised public opinion at the time, but we do have short memories, though. Controversies over, over underfunding of our health services, over, over equipment shortages for the NHS, over putting NHS workers in danger. The idea of the country coming together to fight the virus inevitably recalled the spirit and sacrifice of the nation in World War II, an analogy that was reinforced by both government language and the historical accident the 75th anniversary of VE Day happened right in the middle of lockdown. The clap seemed to become a demonstration to some of caring nationalism. Over the spring and summer, the political divisions in our culture opened up more and more. The Black Lives Matter protests and statue toppling and subsequent guarding fermented fierce arguments over how we record and understand our imperialist past, over the legacies of colonialism and slavery. The storm in a teacup over what to sing at the last night of the proms ended in a summer of bitter but much needed debate. There was an element of carnival to the clap for carers, a chance to be noisy, to free ourselves up in a time of containment and restrictions. Carnival always has the danger of spilling over into riot and disorder. It can also spill over into revolution. It can turn the world upside down, but it can also be a sticking plaster to cover up injustice and social ills. And maybe that is what the Thursday clap became in the end. The Thursday clap for carers was a ritual which spoke much about those times. A rich window into lockdown. It may well have been and gone, but we do need to start to imagine new rituals for these times. A commemorative clap is proposed for its anniversary next March. But we need to create rituals and events where we can safely come together and connect. We need to step out of ourselves into the larger rhythms of life and we need new ways of marking life and death. Maybe too, noise will come back to the streets as we reassert ourselves in a post-Covid world and try to take back control. Certainly, let's make more noise. at the time whether what I was doing was was a tribute to the NHS or simply a welcome break to the quietness of my life at that time or perhaps a mixture of both. I found it provoked an emotional response similar to being at weddings or funerals. 
I was a bit sad when it started to peter out. I banged my sieve, but couldn't hear anyone else out there. You have been listening to The Thursday Noise, an audio documentary exploring the Thursday clap for carers, created by Joyful Noises, a project by Hannah Earl and Tim Hill, commissioned by Seed, an Arts Council England-funded Creative People and Places project based in Sedgemoor, written by Tim Hill, spoken by Hannah Earl and Tim Hill, with contributions from Abigail Hellam, Norma Willis, Jenny Earl, Judy Smithers, John Dyer, Molly Meikle, and Natalie Clayton. Sound recordings and lockdown performances by John Hall, Chris Cundy, Bruno Guastella, Natalie Clayton, Victoria Osborne, Nick Brace, and Hannah Earl. Additional sound and music by Tim Hill. Sources include The Guardian, iClap4.com, Creative Review, and BBC News. Mixed and edited by Tim Hill.